Chapter 8 of Captain John Crane by Thomas Wallace Knox. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. Chapter 8 A Congreve Rocket Among Algerine Pirates. Two or three minutes elapsed after the order was given, and as all on board the Washington had heard it, we were anxiously awaiting the result. Suddenly there was a loud hissing and a swish through the air, and we saw something which left a trail of smoke behind it taking a curving course from the Warwick to the Algerine vessel. It was well aimed as it went aboard the Algerine just over her stern and seemed to rake her from one end to the other. Exactly what those Algerines thought I don't know and even if I did know I wouldn't understand it, as I've no knowledge of their language. We couldn't see that anybody was hurt by the rocket, but everybody on board that craft must have been badly scared. They yelled and ran hither and yon, and about twenty of them jumped overboard, thinking, perhaps, that if they got drowned in the ocean, they might be saved from death by the terrible missile which had just been thrown upon them. While they were in a very lively state of excitement, another rocket went on board, and this added to the confusion which was certainly bad enough before. Captain Dawson signaled to Mr. Johnson to stop firing, and no more rockets were thrown. From a remark that the captain made afterwards, I think he was sorry he didn't follow up his advantage and completely destroyed the Algerine Corsair. He might have done so, possibly, but, on the other hand, he would have received considerable damage from his adversary. My belief is that he did just right in sailing away and holding his course for Gibraltar, closely followed by the Warwick. We had no further trouble after meeting this fellow, though we saw two or three of his kindred at a distance before we reached the Straits. We learned afterwards that a good many of them were out cruising on the Atlantic in search of prizes, but they were scattered considerably in order to cover as much ground as possible. We went through the Straits at a lucky moment, it turned out, as there were nearly always two or three of the Corsairs hanging about that region and rarely going more than twenty or thirty miles away from the entrance to the Mediterranean. We steered into Gibraltar in fine style, and anchored in the harbor which lies in the bay between the town which bears the name of the rock and the Spanish town of Algeciras. The health officer boarded us almost immediately as we dropped anchor, the Washington being first to reach the harbor anchorage. It did not require long for him to ascertain that we were all well on board and entitled to a clean bill of health. Our captain told him about the work, and as soon as he was through with us, he went directly on board of what we may call our prize. He gave a clean bill of health in the work's case as well as in our own, and she was fully entitled to it, as there was no disease on board the suffering which the crew had undergone having come wholly from a lack of food. After the health officer had visited us, he went ashore, and it was not long before the story of the work, the sufferings of the people on board her, and her relief by the American ship that came into port with her, became known in Gibraltar. The captain of the port came off to visit both ships, a very unusual thing for him to do and he made arrangements to take our captain with him to call upon the governor of Gibraltar the next day. And when the call was made, the governor was very civil to Captain Dawson, and said he had performed an act of humanity which deserved high recognition when all its circumstances were considered. He said he should report the circumstances to his government, and hoped that Captain Dawson and our second mate would be suitably rewarded. The captain thanked him for his good wishes, and said he trusted entirely to the generosity of a government whose maritime power was the greatest in the world. 
then he told about the affair with the algerine pirate to which the governor listened attentively he laughed heartily over the incident of the rockets which were he said the invention of sir william congreve and this was the first time he had known of their use in actual warfare he also laughed over captain dawson's description of the consternation created among the piratical crew when the rocket was let loose among them and especially when the captain told about the jumping overboard he said he should mention this matter in his next report as it might prove of great importance to the government i may add here for the reader's information that these rockets were intended to explode and hurl leaden balls and scraps of iron among the enemy they were particularly calculated to frighten horses and break up cavalry operations generally and when tried in actual warfare they were nearly as destructive among infantry they were first tried successfully in warfare and with fatal effect at the attack on copenhagen in eighteen o seven one great advantage of these rockets is that they make no recoil against the stand from which they are fired the largest rocket can therefore be discharged without danger from the smallest boat and consequently in naval attacks on fortresses and cities a flotilla of rocket boats is generally used the great disadvantage of this missile is the uncertainty of its course it was a very lucky circumstance that we were enabled to throw the two rockets that were sent from the warwick directly on board the algerine but we were very near her and thus had a much better aim than if she had been farther away since i quit the sea and sat down to write this narrative i have read somewhere that the duke of wellington was invited to witness a trial of the congreve rocket soon after it was invented and perfected the duke was on horseback surrounded by a large and handsomely uniformed staff the group was assembled at the top of a small hill which commanded a view of the plain where the experiments were to take place a few of the rockets had been let off and the duke seemed well satisfied with their performance finally one rocket at its discharge took an erratic course and came directly into the midst of the distinguished party where it fizzed and sputtered while darting here and there and then dashing off to one side exploded if the explosion had taken place directly in the group some of the officers would probably have been killed or wounded as it was the horses were frightened and fully one half the party were thrown to the ground and had to walk home or wait till their horses were caught and brought to them from that moment the duke of wellington was never favorable to the use of the congreve rocket but i'm getting away from my story as the news spread about gibraltar of the saving of the warwick and those whom we found on board of her the officers and crew of the washington became the objects of considerable attention captain dawson did not neglect to take the proper steps for obtaining his claim for salvage he employed a lawyer of gibraltar to attend to the matter and it is proper to say that the lawyer did his duty faithfully the claim was considerably reduced by the court but nevertheless it was a handsome compensation and everybody concerned on our side of the affair felt well rewarded for his trouble a special award was made to mr johnson and the six men who went with him on board the warwick this was done we understood at the insistence of the governor of gibraltar who seemed rather more kindly disposed towards us than was usually the case with english officers towards americans at that time when any of the crew of the washington obtained liberty to go on shore they were treated kindly and very often too by the british sailors and landsmen one effect of the hospitality of gibraltar was that those of our crew who were not abstemious from drink 
generally returned to the ship much the worse for their excursion. One afternoon several of us, including Haynes and myself, had permission to go ashore. It was very hot that day, and we found it rather fatiguing work to walk about. About dusk we concluded it was time to go on board again and went down to the quay for that purpose. There we fell in with some English sailors, most of whom had been drinking heavily, and they began to treat us very uncivilly. Of course we resented, and the result was a row. It was necessary for the police to interfere, but before they could do so, there was a general fight in which the chances were about even. I had the misfortune to be knocked down, and so hard was the blow that I was virtually insensible. The last I remember of the struggle I was seized by the collar and arms and dragged roughly away. On coming to my senses I found myself in a guardhouse, along with Haynes and two other men from the Washington, with a sentry on duty to prevent our getting away. Haynes had been rubbing my limbs and trying in other ways to restore me, and was very much delighted when I was able to speak. He had a swollen face so that he was able to see out of but one eye, and that not very well. One of my first questions was as to what they were going to do with us. "'I'm sure I don't know,' said Haynes. "'I've been pumping the sentry, and all I can make out is that we've been disorderly and can't stir till an officer comes to take charge of us.' We were hungry and thirsty and asked for water and something to eat. The sentry called another soldier who brought us some water but said it would take money to buy anything else. We gave the fellow a shilling, and he went off to return presently with some fruit, which probably cost him a penny or two, as fruit is very cheap in Gibraltar. The rest of the money he pocketed, or perhaps divided with our guard, as we didn't see it again or get anything for it. It was along in the evening when this happened, and we had to stay in the guardhouse until morning, sleeping on the floor and using our jackets for pillows. The next morning we were taken to what I supposed was the office of the chief of police, or the commandant of the port. I couldn't make out which. A man in uniform looked at us but asked no questions and in less than five minutes he ordered us taken on board the receiving ship in the harbor. This was one of the king's ships that had been pronounced unseaworthy, and was used as a storehouse, prison, or anything else that was required of her. She was especially used to receive sailors till they were drafted off to one of the warships that needed men. "'They're going to take us to serve the king,' said Haynes. "'They want men, and they don't care how they get them. "'But the king hasn't anything to do with us,' I replied. "'We're Americans, and not his subjects now.' "'I've asked there, my lad,' said Haynes. "'What do you think the king or his officers care about that?' Don't you remember our little affair in the early part of the voyage with that British man o war Oh, I certainly do, I replied. But the officer who came aboard did not try to take anybody away that he knew was an American. Yes, that's true, Haynes replied. And the trouble with him was, from a British point of view, that he was too particular and also that he lost his head over the captain's rum bottle. Not one officer in twenty, so far as I've known, would hesitate at taking just as many men as he wanted, whether they were British-born or not. You see, that officer wasn't right in his head when he got drunk so easily at a time when he should have stayed sober. It looks to me very much, Haynes continued as though they intend to impress us in punishment for our disorderly conduct. 
I presume that's what they do when Americans come ashore and give any sort of reason for being arrested. Off they go to the king's receiving ship, and whenever wanted they are drafted into one of his majesty's men of war. But make yourself easy, my lad, we won't have any trouble. As soon as they find that we belong to the crew of the Washington, that little affair of the work will set everything right. While he spoke, an officer appeared. What he was, I don't know, but he had uniform enough on him for a general or an admiral, at least. He spoke to the officer in charge of us and called him to one side. There was quite an earnest talk between them, but of course we don't know what it was. Anyhow, it was something in our favor as we were taken back to where we spent the night and our keeper treated us very civilly after the heavily uniformed officer went away. He asked if we would like some breakfast, and on our saying we would, he gave an order to one of the soldiers to bring us something to eat. In less than a quarter of an hour we had a big pan of beef stew before us, along with a large loaf of bread and as much coffee as we wanted to drink. It was a real good breakfast, and every one of us felt a great deal better after we had eaten it. That it was the intention to impress us into the British service, I have not the least doubt, and Haynes was correct when he suggested that the affair of the work would save us. I heard afterward that not a few American sailors who became drunk and disorderly while on shore at Gibraltar and other British ports, had been sent to jail overnight, and to a receiving ship in the morning. They had no chance of escape, and in the course of time, and very short at that, found themselves serving on British ships of war. At the time of which I write, no fewer than 4,000 impressed Americans were serving on British ships. That number had been reported through the councils and other representatives of the United States abroad, and it is probable that two or three thousand more were unable to make their situations known. They were not allowed to send letters to their friends, and when in port, whether in British ports or not, they were never allowed ashore, lest they might escape or, at all events, send a communication that would call attention to their impressment. We had quite a talk on the subject as we sat and lay around after our breakfast, waiting to see what would next turn up. Haynes predicted that in less than ten years the United States would have another war with Great Britain, and it would grow out of this very business of the impressment of American sailors. It is said that at one time a British officer who was taking some men from an American vessel remarked to the captain of it, I wonder that the Americans permit this sort of thing to go on. Great Britain wouldn't stand it in an hour, and I think the same can be said of every nation on the continent of Europe. Well, we wouldn't have stood it an hour either if we had had a navy like that of Great Britain. She had a thousand sail, and we had less than twenty warships, taking all kinds and descriptions together. I'll tell you a bit of my experience, said Haynes, in this impressing business, and you can see just how it is. It's no wonder that the relations between the United States and Great Britain are what they are when the sort of thing I'm going to tell you about can go on. I was going out to Havana in the Brig Julia in the latter part of 1798, said Haynes, and there were several sail of us under convoy of the twenty-gun sloop of war Baltimore. We were in sight of the Morrow Castle, at the entrance of the port of Havana, and a dandy port it is, room enough for a thousand sail inside, but only one can go in or out at a time. 
Captain Phillips of the Baltimore made signal for us to crowd sail as hard as we could to get into port. It seemed that he had seen an English squadron away to the windward, and knew they would capture us if they could as they were blockading Havana. In fact, they did take three of us, but the rest got in all right, and among them was the Julia. After he had signaled to his convoy, Captain Phillips bore up to speak to the English Commodore, who was in the Carnatic 74, and he had four other warships with her, one of them a big fellow with 98 guns. When Captain Phillips got near the Carnatic, the English captain, his name was Loring, invited the American to go and visit him aboard. Captain Phillips went, and what do you suppose the Englishman told him when he got him there? I can't guess, I'm sure. What was it? Why, he said he intended to take out of the Baltimore all the men who had no American protection papers. Captain Phillips protested and said it was an outrage on his nation and flag, and he would surrender his ship if Captain Loring insisted upon doing as he had threatened. You see, there were only twenty American guns on the Baltimore against more than three hundred on the British fleet. Then he went back to his ship where he found an English officer mustering his crew. What did he do then? He took the muster roll out of the officer's hand, ordered the officer to leeward, and sent the men to their quarters. Then he consulted an American legal gentleman who happened to be on board, and as his instructions were that on no account should any vessel of any nation except France be molested, even to prevent the capture of his convoy, he decided to surrender. He ordered the Baltimore's flag hauled down, and told the English captain to do what he pleased with the ship. The Englishman sent on board and took away fifty-five of the Baltimore's crew. But very soon he returned fifty of them, and said he had a number of Americans on the Carnatic that he'd be glad to trade for an equal number of Englishmen. Did the American captain make the trade with him? No, he didn't. He waited for the Englishman to send a prize crew to take possession of the Baltimore, but evidently the British captain was afraid of getting into trouble, as he sailed away without another word. When he had gone, Captain Phillips put up the Baltimore's flag again and went about his business, and if they'd treat a ship of war in that way, do you suppose they'd have any fine feelings about a merchantman? We all assented to his view of the case, and then Haynes said we owed what navy we then had to the Algerine pirates. If it hadn't been for them, said he, we wouldn't have any navy now, I believe. Surely the pirates did not present us with any ships of war, I exclaimed in surprise. Oh no, twasn't that way at all. Just cast anchor a bit, and I'll tell you how it was. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tom Hirsch